Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel according to St. Matthew, the 21st chapter. Jesus said, Hear another parable. There was a householder who planted a vineyard, set a hedge around it, dug a wine press in it, built a tower, and let it out to tenants, and went away into another country. When the season of fruit drew near, he sent his servants to the tenants to get his fruit. And the tenants took his servants, beat one, killed one, and stoned another. Again, he sent other servants, more than the first. They did the same to them. Afterward, he sent his son to them, saying, They will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, This is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. They took him and cast him out of the vineyard and killed him. When therefore the owner of the vineyard comes, what will he do with those tenants? They said to him, he'll put those wretches to a wretched death and let out the vineyard to other tenants who will give him the fruits in their seasons. Jesus said to them, Have you never read in the scriptures the very stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner? This was the Lord's doing, and it is marvelous in our eyes. Therefore I tell you, the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a nation producing the fruits of it. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard his parables, they perceived that he was speaking about them. When they tried to arrest him, they feared the multitudes because they held him to be a prophet. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we give you thanks for you have blessed us with the gift of this day, with life and with faith. So we have gathered in your son's name and we pray that you would help us Turn our hearts, our minds, our thoughts, our lives from the things of the world to be drawn to the things that are eternal, to your love for us and your will. Guide us by your Spirit now that we might, through this word, know your will and through your Spirit have strength to do it. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Does it ever seem odd to you? I mean, we've been doing this for weeks now, talking about stuff that you and I have no connection to at all. I mean, let me me just check. Would you raise your hand if you have ever picked grapes in a vineyard? (gasps) Well, I I apologize. My gosh, what were you doing there? Making wine, weren't you? You I mean, that's our connection. The rest of us appreciate the work you did in the vineyard, Uh, because then we probably got some wine out of that. But there are so many stories that Jesus is talking about that in many ways don't seem to apply. We we don't know about vineyards and vats and hedges and and watchtowers. That's not our area. But of course, this is not like poor Jesus' almanac. This, This is not about how you plant a vineyard. It's not guiding us that. It's how you live in the kingdom of God. Because this, it's described as a parable, but really, in some ways, is better understood as an allegory. Now, you remember the difference. A parable is something with one main point, and we always want to make sure that we understand what that point is. Uh, Some of the examples may or may not be appropriate. An allegory, there are various players in the story which apply to certain people. The Pharisees understood that. So by the time Jesus is finished with his stories and his allegories, they are are quite aware that he's talking about them, and they don't come off very well. So what we've got today is an allegory, and and it's about a householder um, who has a vineyard, and he develops the vineyard. Who would that be, do you think? In an allegory, something represents somebody else. Who would that be? God the Father. Yes, thank you, Kay. Kay works often with children. And let me just mention, the number one answer to every children's homily question is God. 
Okay, just so, you know, okay, it's young at heart. So, uh, yes, that, that is God. Now, now it, it's, the story is really about the attention this owner puts into the vineyard. I mean, he's got a hedge around it to protect it. He's got a watchtower. He plants fine plants in there and then lets it out to tenants. He's concerned not just about the fruit, but for the benefit of them. If he got lousy, cheaper vineyard uh, um, to plant, um, those guys would not have as much to live on, nor would he get as much. So he pays attention. Now, if, if that's God and we've got a vineyard, what do you think the vineyard is? How would that apply to us? The vineyard is where we live. I mean, we, we can't live without that vineyard. We, we are sitting uh, on the earth, and there's protection around us. Anybody think of the protection we have? There are all kinds of protection God put in place, but one in particular, what we don't see, but is crucial for our life, the air, the atmosphere. If, if you don't have the atmosphere, they'll always tell you, if you go up a mountain, uh, you better put sunscreen on because already that's dangerous. Anybody know where the death zone begins? How many miles up? Five. Five. In Peru, we go three, and we really struggle to breathe at 15,800 feet. At 26,000 feet, you're done. We have a little area of the universe. I would have looked up how broad it is, but I think they're still trying to figure it out, you know, the fair amount of distance from that end if they ever figure where that is. So we, out of all of this, as far as we know, now the, the guess is there must be other places to live. I mean, could it really be just one place in the entire universe and it's just us? No, as far as we know. This is the place. And we have a five-mile band because how far down below water level can you go? and live, depending on what you put on, but you can't live there naturally. In a tub, it can be too deep. So, so we have just this little area. God is providing for us what we need for life. That's God's gift to us, and, and uh, protecting us, and providing for us. And there are tenants, not just us, but who else in the story would be the tenants? It's clear by the end of the story who Jesus is referring to. The Jews. We have the Old Testament lesson that's talking about the vineyard. Israel is like a vineyard. Jesus says, I am the vine, you are the branches. Any Jew would have understood that imagery because God takes and plants Israel in the promised land. They are like a vineyard. And God provides, oh, the, you know, huge, beautiful fruits and especially tasty after being in the wilderness for 40 years. Uh, so God has provided for us all that we need, and we ought to <clears throat> provide an acknowledgement. In the story, what's the acknowledgement that this vineyard is not theirs? How would a tenant acknowledge that that's not their vineyard somebody else's you pay rent so at the season when the fruit comes in you give that now you know i gotta be careful here because there are some values to this but nonetheless why in the world do we make a donation to god i mean we will talk about it that way that that your donation we we have said that sometimes people have come and said pastor it's tough times i lost my job da -da -da -da. i made a pledge I made a pledge, but I just can't fulfill it. And any of our pastors would say to them, you, you didn't make that pledge to us. That was a pledge to God. And if God, in, in his wisdom, you are now at a point where you don't have those resources, how would you give what God didn't give you? So it's an offering to God. The acknowledgement of the fruit offering is an acknowledgement it's God. He doesn't need it. It's all his. I mean, he, he, he doesn't drink fine wine. He doesn't need, he's like a vegan. He doesn't eat meat. Well, he doesn't eat fruit. He doesn't, he doesn't need any of it. But our offering to him is an acknowledgement that we have this for a very brief time. Responsibility 
for a limited amount of God's creation. Minuscule amount. Uh, that was the psalm for, I think, uh, t uh, tomorrow, maybe tomorrow, uh, uh, in the faith matters. You know, what is man that you pay attention to him? We're like a breath. Why would you care about us? But he has provided for us resources, and we're working hard not to be possessed by our possessions. These tenants, as the story progresses, begin to act as if it's theirs. And the only problem is that guy who thinks it's his. And so they beat up and they stone and they kill the servants of the master. Those would be who in the allegory? The prophets, John the Baptist, Jeremiah, there, there are lots of them that are stoned, that are suffering. They are bringing that word and will of the vineyard owner. They are sharing it so that they would know, but they reject it. That's what sin does to us. It makes us believe that somehow there's a difference between having uh, in our nature, our status, based on how much stuff we have for a brief time. Where, where did that ever come from? Where did it ever come from that what you've got really should be mine? You ever watch kids? You were a kid once, but I'm sure you weren't like this. But I've seen little kids. If you had 50 toys in a room with two kids, and there are new toys, old toys, big toys, power toys, uh, sit and still toys, all active toys, got every kind of toy you can imagine are there in the room, and there are two kids. Which one do they want? The one, Tom, yeah, that was too fast. <laughs> you saw it with your boy. Oh, yeah. Yeah, exactly. You put two kids together. The biggest one, the oldest one, will grab the toy away from the little one, and then what do they do? They don't beat them with it. What do they do? Think about it. What do they do? They watch it. How does that feel? Take it away. Now it's mine. Now you don't have it. They watch and enjoy the kid. <laughs> I am in power. I'm in control till dad comes, <laughs> uh, or mom, whichever comes first. How do we get so possessed by our possessions? Parable is about what? Kingdom of God. So the young man, who is very rich, comes to Jesus and says, I I've done everything that's needed. The law is all obeyed. What do I have to do to enter the kingdom of God? One thing, once you are so close, you are on the verge. It's not 50 things, not 20, it's not even five, it's not even two. One thing, right now you are possessed. Oh, I, I need a, uh, an exorcism or something. No, no, you are possessed by your possessions. Give them to the poor and come and follow me. I'll get back to it. Uh, I'll, I'm going to think about that. There's probably something deep theology I need to consider in that. He went away very sad because he was very rich. It's very hard for a rich person to get into the kingdom of God. Why? Because they got too much stuff they're carrying? No, because they don't want to go there. You got how much time? Mm -hmm. So I got to be careful. Chris, I think she's dozing off up there. Um, I, uh, let me. Just, she's not. But I, I did want to say um, now what we have done, and I give it out as a marital or for anybody by yourself. You look forward to things, right? And, and so, twelve days we're going to go to Williamsburg if we're not on a cruise. I'll just tell you. And so, twelve days, eleven days, ten days. The spreadsheet goes down. Pink magic marker. I said, Chris, what I should do is now that I'm assisting. And I don't have all that. Uh, okay, what I'll do is count up. You know, day one, day two, day three. I'm on day four right now. And then I thought, how many days do I put? <laughs> like 55 years, not likely. I'm, I'm not figuring to get that much. How much? Do you know? It'll come suddenly like a, a thief in the dark. We've noticed that. We have, we have some members really struggling. I mean, there, there's Marty's sister. What's the goal of the day? Go downstairs and get something. That's all. And it was her last step. 
we have a very limited time, but we act as if all this stuff that we have gathered is ours and we have it forever, and it is not true. So we ignore that word of God. He wants to tell us. Paul says in Philippians, just a little bit earlier than this, got to be really careful about setting your mind on earthly things. If that's where your heart is, you get drawn there. Because then there is no room for that one who is the king of kings, who brings a kingdom which is not short-lived, which is not with ending, but eternal. So it seems as if the end of the story has come because the master sent the, 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 the son, and the son is murdered. What was he thinking? How much graciousness could the master have for his people? I've given you prophet after prophet after prophet, and at last I send my son. In these last days I've sent you my son, and you kill him. I added in the word. It's there in the Greek, so I didn't you know, do something inappropriate with the reading of the word. If you were following along, he will take those wretches, Greek word, and bring them wretched death. Same word. It's that bad. It can't get any worse. And that would be the end of the story. Except there are other tenants. This is the change. This is the transition where the son who dies doesn't become the end of the story, but the beginning. St. Paul is describing, it's really, yeah, I don't remember a lot of Greek, but some things I do. Uh, and, and sometimes it can be fun. Sometimes I can't tell you how much fun it is. But I will tell you this time, when St. Paul says, uh, you know, all the stuff I did, I mean, I, uh, I have got my credentials from Phariseeism and tribe of Benjamin and all the, I've done all the laws and I consider it all refuse. That's a euphemism. It's not refuse. It's what dogs leave behind. That's what he said. All of that stuff that was my greatest pride is nothing compared to knowing the Lord Jesus Christ. To have life in him. To know Jesus as Savior, Christ as the King, Lord and Master of my life. To live in Christ, the stone rejected by the Jews is now going to become the cornerstone. We got a cornerstone. It's huge. What are you, crazy? Look at that temple. Nobody could tear that down. Nobody could dislodge those ton after ton after ton. We've got a cornerstone already. We don't need any more cornerstones. 70 AD, remember what happened? Destruction of the temple. Never to be rebuilt. The wailing wall over in Jerusalem, the western wall of Herod's temple. Nobody goes in any closer. They can't get any closer to God because if you go past there, you might end up in the Holy of Holies, which they've lost. They don't know where it is. But then there's this one rabbi, no soldiers, no weapons, no anything. And he goes to the cross and dies, and everybody knows that's too bad. I thought he was going to be something. I thought he was going to do something. <laughs> it's all over. I don't know about you guys. I'm going back fishing, Peter says. I, what else are we going to do? And then some women, you know how women are, you know, idle tale, said they saw him. <laughs> you know, women. Yeah, women. Women of the church. Uh, I don't have enough time. We could count here today how much our guys are holding the fort. Not much. So the witness of these tenants, what changed? A, a new perspective? A new idea? What changed in those people? Everybody knows if the leader's gone, and he was, he disappeared, nobody saw him again, that that's over unless those guys have more power than they used to. They got to have some real power from on high, like the Spirit of God. So they 
begin to do stuff. But it was not because they had to. It's what they got to do. So the Holy Spirit filled them, and they, they produced fruit. You must know this. The fruit of the Spirit, love and joy and peace and patience and gentleness and self-control, all those things, who taught them that? They already knew that, but now out of the heart with the Spirit empowering them. It made perfect sense. And these tenants loved even their enemies, loved the ones who were crucifying them, Love the ones that were stoning them, like St. Stephen. Father, forgive them. They don't, they don't know what they're doing. I've heard that before. They become connected to the cornerstone that everybody else threw away. It becomes the cornerstone of their lives so that 2,000 years later, we meet in his name. We have no other hope. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. That's where the hope of the tenants lie. It is good to be a tenant in the house of the Lord, serve him and be blessed by him. I play, pray our witness would be strong in this day. In Jesus' name, amen. Take a few moments to meditate on the word and the will of God.